Hey, this is Brandon Vietti, one of the producers of Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Greg Wiseman, 0, 0, 1. Recognized, Brandon Vietti, 0, 0, 2. Initiate, part 2. Ben Schwartz's other question, because he sent us two, was about what skills have taken you both the longest time to hone over the course of your career so far, and which ones came more naturally? <sighs> Still just dig through your entire history still being honed <laughs> i know it's i mean it's I, i'm still honing everything i feel like every time we do a show yeah. i i'm finding like oh i gotta get better at that Oop, i gotta get better at that you know i feel like there's never a point where i'm like all right i've got this down <laughs> it's like it, it never works that way for me so i mean every muscle's getting stronger whether it's you know helping direct the art helping with the story helping with the editing, helping with the music, you know, all of those, every process, every step of the way, every chance that I get to go through those steps, I'm learning from the people that I'm working with, you know, at the end result, you always look at the end result and kind of step back away from it. And you know what your intention was, but did it work? Did it fall short? Yeah. And, you know, you learn from, from that, evaluating it when it's done and what could have been better? What could I have done better? So I'm yeah. constantly asking myself that question. Which may be one reason why Brandon is ridiculously good at everything. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is just going to sound bizarre even to Brandon, but I've mellowed a lot. Uh, I mean, learning to calm down and not let everything, you know, piss me off. And that's something that's been a big learning process over 30 years in this business is uh, not shooting from the hip, but um, being more contemplative i think that you know he's right that we're constantly honing i mean there's some things i am color deficient red green color deficient there are certain things i'm never going to be good at period i can't draw i'm not trying <laughs> it's not something i'm trying to learn but you know you i i think for me part of it is much more uh sort of the emotional side of things being more mature you know, I, I like to think I've gotten better as a writer as I go. Certain things are, are more facile for me, without a doubt. I mean, I know that when I started in this business, literally the format of, of a teleplay was very intimidating to me. It seemed so artificial. It was so rigid and forced. It was very scary to me. I, I, I literally shied away from it for a long time. I'd been writing prose and I'd been writing comic books where the format is even if you're doing a full script as opposed to quote unquote Marvel style where you do the plot first and the dialogue later, the format is much more flexible. You can kind of define it as long as you're giving the artist what he or she needs. But the teleplay format was very intimidating to me. And now I'm just so used to it. It's like, no big deal. That's easy. That's not the problem at all. You know, I, I think the idea thing that you I learned pretty early on and I had really good teachers is the idea that a teleplay a screenplay is not an end in itself it's a blueprint for a building you're trying to build and you need other people to help you build it and so the main thing that we strive for in our scripts is clarity that doesn't mean that we're giving everything away from a spoiler standpoint but it means that the artists are part of the team they need to know if a character's in silhouette in the background i don't just say some mysterious guys in silhouette because they yeah. need to know who that character is you know kind of thing so you know it, it, it's all about creating clarity in the scripts and that's something that you hone and then you know you try and create clarity in as few words as possible so that the script length isn't too long and i'm constantly learning tricks for keeping things short without losing clarity. 
making descriptions brief without losing any clarity. But in general, I think, uh, you know, in terms of growth for me, it's been more emotional than, than uh, objective, you know, kind of thing. It's an emotional journey because, I mean, you come up with these stories, you get attached to these characters. And I think especially for Greg and I, we tend to have pretty sharp ideas on how something should be executed. And, and every producer and writer is, is different. There are definitely producers and writers that like figure it out as they go. And then there's others that like kind of know right off the bat exactly what they want and need. And I think Greg and I are kind of the latter. We tend to be we, can, we tend to know what we want early on. And I mean, we do that for production reasons. Tim, we're, we're, we're wired that way naturally. So that's good for the production because then you have this template that everybody can kind of follow. If you're figuring it out as you go, that's expensive because that means you're exploring. <laughs> it's true. Very it's good. You're, yeah, you're exploring, you're going down the wrong path, you're having to reverse and go back and redo things. And it's, expensive to redo things so it pays well to like know in advance exactly what you want to do but you also have to and greg was hitting on this you have to like really be open to working with your team so we've got these sharp ideas but there might be more than one way to execute those ideas and present those ideas right and i think that's where it, it you have to like stay loose emotionally <laughs> uh not get too married to your ideas uh you, you got to Keep your compass like focused on your end point, where it needs to go, but know that your artists, your teams, your 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 actors, your your other writers, your um, composers, everybody's going to help get you there. But it might not be the journey that you think it's going to be. And I think um, I think a lot of people don't think of that when they think of what producers do. That so much of the job is like pivoting and rerouting and finding new ways to get to an end point staying focused on the end point but allowing other people in on the creative process yeah. um it has to be that way otherwise like nobody has fun like nobody wants to be completely handcuffed on your artistic team everybody wants to be able to help in that journey so you have to have that flexibility it, it takes for instance i'm shorthanding it but i mean you know, the, the great idea that, you know, Greg has or that I have might take like five minutes in a room. And then you spend a year and a half protecting that one idea. People come and they want to pivot that idea, move it this way, move it that way. And you have to figure out like which ways you can move that won't hurt the idea and which ways you can move that, you know, will. So you're, yeah. you're protecting that idea while allowing some flexibility to see it realized over the course of a year or a year and a half to get it done. Yeah. It, it reminds me of like, I have taken playwriting classes and one of my playwriting professors would always tell us when we bring in a script and somebody to have a script where the entire first page is being like, this is exactly what the stage looks like. He's like, stop doing the set designer's job. That's not your job. <laughs> like you let someone else add on to your ideas. You tell them the things that need to be there and then you leave it be and see where they take it. Uh, and I feel like that's a lot of any creative industry like that has a lot of those things where it's like everybody has to do their thing and you build a thing together. Yeah. When you work with a team, it's absolutely essential and it, and it's fun and it's rewarding. And, and I've learned things from that. I think, you know, I've had to back down from that as well. You know, my journey to the producer's chair was through directing as a yeah. director. It was my job to like, you know, be locked in on everything and know exactly how I wanted to present things. But moving into the producer role, I had to let all of that go. And it took me a while to learn that. Yeah. Nobody teaches you that when you step into that role. Um, and it was a process. But, you know, I think the, the sooner you can welcome that process and get your head around it, again, it's, it's rewarding. It goes back to your other question. Like, I, I, I learned things that way. I honed skills by working with other people and seeing how they might approach a problem that I think I solved already. I, I know what I'd do, but you see somebody else's approach and it's like, oh, I hadn't considered that. That's interesting. I just learned something. Yeah. So it's a rewarding process. Yeah. So moving on to shifting gears to some season three related questions a little bit since the last time that we talked to you, we were still in the middle of season three premiering. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I have something I want to say about this. Feel free. <laughs> because I think there's been confusion about it, and I, there's something I want to clear up. Okay. Lucas Carr, 
owns this house with a garage, an apple orchard in Happy Harbor, across the street from an undeveloped beach. He rents the apartment that's above the garage to Connor and Megan. Above the garage is the great room, which we've seen them in, which is the kitchen, living room sort of thing. And then there's a staircase down to their bedroom and bathroom. So it's a one bedroom apartment on two levels. But the house, the bigger house, which we've never been inside, is Lucas's house. That's where he lives. And we've been on the deck of that. You know, he's got an outdoor deck there. And we've been on the deck and we've been obviously in the apple orchard. And we've been in the garage, both upstairs and downstairs. But we've never been inside Lucas's house. And there seems to be some confusion about that that I find mind-boggling because I think we've been pretty goddamn clear about it. But I want to once and for all make it clear what the setup is there. Thank you very Lucas's much. Lucas's property, Connor and McGann rent the apartment in the garage. Yes. We need, we need blueprints. We need blueprints or we will be perpetually way, confused. Yes. <laughs> of course they do. Uh, yeah, no, we're... <laughs> There are certain things that we as viewers will just always be confused about. I don't know. I like, I will include myself in that. I don't know why that it took, took us a full season and an audio play to understand the full setup of that house. Uh, but it did. Uh, it looked fine, but now, now everybody knows. Yeah. Now and that can, can the, little, the little <laughs> nod in the audio play felt very much like I, feel like, I feel like all of us are being called out for not understanding blueprints. <laughs> Which is fine. We, had, we appreciate the confusion being cleared up. But my actual season three related question, we had mentioned before that there was that uh, five year real time gap between uh, the production of season two and the production of season three. So I was curious, did that time gap really affect the story that you ended up telling or was outsiders in it at least in its general form, always the season three that you had kind of envisioned even back when you were on Cartoon Network and everything? Uh, generally, yes, it was. I mean, we have a, a long-term plan, at least five years. I mean, we had, I should say, now it's past five years, but back in season <laughs> one, we had a basic five-year, five-season plan. Yeah. And that hasn't shifted all that much. But Lots of details changed. I mean, one thing that really came in, um, I want to say, in season three, and again, it just felt like this fit what we wanted to do anyway, you know, with Markovia. But the idea of um, at that time, there were all from various countries, Arab Springs and failed Arab Springs, and uh, there were all these refugees from the Middle East coming into Europe. and that seemed to fit with our theme of meta human trafficking with the idea that we were doing this major story set in this Eastern European country. And so I, that wasn't an idea that we had in advance, that idea of the Karakis fleeing into Markovia. And that's just an example. I mean, in other words, there's a, if you look at any given thing in season three, there are probably elements that we had in mind, I don't know about day one, but from back in the Cartoon Network days, and then elements that, you know, just came to us at the time. Again, as we discussed earlier, the plan for Beast Boy was just to, he's off making a television show, and obviously partway through creating the scripts for, or breaking the stories for season three, we realized, no, that's not where Beast Boy is going to stay, yeah. at least not exclusively. So there's always stuff. I mean, the general rule is, that, as with anything, like what Brandon was talking about in the last question is, we've got these ideas and there are certain aspects to it that are pretty fixed for us, but we've got to be flexible on how to execute them. Yeah. And um, we want to be present. Uh, the influence of social media was so huge um, in terms of 
even getting the show back yeah. at all, that social media became this big thing that of course we weren't thinking about during season one and two because we were largely ignorant of social media in season one and two. I'm not saying the world was, but we were. <laughs> and it became something that we sort of learned about. I still don't understand Facebook, but, um, but at least I kind of understand Twitter. I'm not, I don't always like it, but I kind of understand it. Um, and so, you know, that became something that, again, had a much bigger impact on season three that we hadn't even thought about back in the Cartoon Network days. But a lot of the basic themes and the basic uh, long-term plans for some of these for these characters, that was stuff that, again, we had, you know, again, the, the larger plan hasn't changed, just the how we execute it and the details. And then, you know, sometimes the new details come in and that influences who Halo is and, and then where she's going to go in her journey. And we don't know all that stuff all out of the gate um, for, and not just for Halo, that was just an example, but for all the characters, you know, each character, I should say. You know, again, they begin to tell us where they need to go next. But we do have a really general game plan for it. And that hasn't really changed. Hmm. So the most recent Young Justice thing that has happened at the time that we are recording all of this was the DC Fandom audio play uh, that was released just a couple months back from when we're recording this. It will probably be a few more months back by the time everyone is hearing this. But uh, so I had just a couple of things related to that if we're allowed to talk about it. Sure. I know I know that you, Greg, have written a couple of audio plays for convention events in the past, uh, often doing crossovers with some of the other series that you've written. So when this one got announced, I was curious, how did that get started as a thing that you do at conventions? Because I have seen a couple of them on YouTube and they are always very fun. But what kind of started that as something you did? And then how did you all decide to put one together for DC Fandom? Well, way back when we had these conventions for uh, a TV show I did in the 90s called Gargoyles. And uh, one of the things that I thought we could do at these Gargoyles conventions that might be fun, we usually had one or two actors from the show present at the convention. So I'm like, well, let's pull out an old Gargoyles script. And whatever actor happens to be there, say it's Tom Adcox, who uh, in our sh in YJ plays Clarion, but back in Gargoyles played Lexington. Let's have Tom play Lexington, and and we'll we'll hold auditions and cast the rest of the show from fans, and fans then get to perform with Tom Adcox, which is super cool, mm -hmm. and they get to perform in front of the rest of the convention, and. We tried it once and I thought, I have no idea if this is going to work. And then it did. And it was like, oh, well, that's, that worked out. Everyone had a good time. I don't say it was brilliant theater, but it, everyone had fun, which yeah. of course is the point, you know? So as time passed, those things became more and more elaborate. Um, so the last one I did at Convergence uh, in Minneapolis uh, with Chris Jones who co-founded that convention. Um, Chris Carter was also a guest. One of our composers was one of the guests. Yes. And, and when he found out I was doing this radio play, he said, Hey, would you like me to do some musical accompaniment? Like, you know, like a silent movie, you know, the guy in the, on the piano who's playing. And I'm like, that'd be great. And then I'm like, Hey, and this is again, I have these ideas sometimes that I so regret later, but I was like, Hey, what if we made it a musical? And he's like, yeah. And we were, and so we, and then the convention staff got very, very excited about that. And then you could say, see as they are getting excited about it, Chris and I are thinking, oh my God, what did we just get ourselves into? So when fandom was being planned early on, there was just some discussion. What can we do? Because YJ is just not that close to, Season yeah. four, just not that close to being up. It's not like we had footage to show. Yeah. We didn't have any footage, not then. Um, and we try to remember the order of events, but there was just a <laughs> desire to get some new material out there, right? Brandon, is that yeah. how you remember it? And, yeah. and so because I'd done these radio plays, I thought, well, 
I could do that. And they're like, great, can you do one that's set during season four? And Brandon and I were both like, no, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're not going to give away what took place. It's taking place during the season. Just um, all the spoilers we could in do one a event. little <laughs> in between thing between season three, a little prequel to the season. We thought that would be fair game. And we, we could be careful about what we reveal without, you know, revealing too much, but throwing a little, you know, throwing some Easter eggs, throwing a few hints. Some of the hints would be clearly hints when you saw the radio play, and some would only be hints in hindsight after you, you know, had seen season four. And we could do all that. And so the first step was the exact opposite of how we normally write, which is that we had to find out what actors would be available on a specific day yeah. and time. It, you know, normally we write, we'll, you know, and we assume all our actors will be able to come in and record eventually <laughs> um, and that kind of thing. But obviously for this kind of thing, I needed to know in advance exactly who was available. So Winston, who's our great Warner Brothers publicity guy, and I'm not just saying it because I know he's listening right now, <laughs> actually had to go out and sort of find out which actors, you know, were able to do it. And um, we gave him sort of a, a list of, uh, I don't know, like 14 actors that we thought we would be good choices. And then once we found out who was available, Brandon and I sat down and came up with the basics for what the story was going to be. But then by the time we were done with that, so much time had passed that I had almost no time to write the damn thing, which, so it just got, I had to write it in a very short period of time, which meant I was staying up very, very late, later even than I usually stay up. And I usually don't go to bed till like two or three in the morning. So it got kind of goofy, but I think that, that worked well. For, I think. I think that works well for an audio play Zoom call kind of thing. Yeah. You know, the, the goofiness, I think, actually sort of helped. And it was fun, you know, to sort of say, okay, Crispin, you're going to play all three of the Harper brothers and Captain Boomerang. And, uh, oh, yeah, Nolan, you're also going to be a gorilla. <laughs> um, and that kind of thing, just, you know, make Danica play Tuppence Terra as well as Miss Martian, you know just have some fun with it. And, and of course our cast is just so phenomenal, but really it's tough to be Brandon. The Eddie is as warden economist. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, he set the bar so high that, you know, it was tough for the rest of our cast to meet that level. Worst to me to do one line and one word. I'm so shy to, I, <laughs> I, I have to do one, one word. <laughs> One <laughs> you can yeah, tell that is, that is not a, a career for me, but I am glad that you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's, it was so cool that to see to to allow the the fans to see what we get to see in the booth, and that yeah. is the flexibility of our actors and watching them jump back and forth between these characters. I mean, watching Crispin, you know, flip flop, you know, between like three different characters is just it's phenomenal. It's just, it's amazing to watch. So yeah, I was glad we got that opportunity to kind of spotlight them and, and show the, show the world what we get to see every day. And that is how amazing they are to yeah. watch them perform. I mean, the thing with Crispin in that show, and he's not the only one who does it. I mean, Nolan does it with Superboy and Superman. And, but the thing that was great there is you, you really see Crispin is basically using the same voice, not for Boomerang, <laughs> obviously, but the exact same voice for, Will and Roy and Jim. And yet, I don't think there's a moment in that script other than maybe the first five seconds or so of those characters when you're just establishing in the first place. Yeah. But I don't think there's a moment in that audio play when you don't know which one he's, he's speaking, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, it's easy when he's doing Captain Boomerang and uh, because it's got the Australian accent, that, that that's the easy thing. Or, uh, you know, even like Calder and Black Manta, because Kari, it, it's the same basic voice, but he pushes his voice down yeah. deeper. But seeing what Crispin was able to do with uh, Roy Will and 
and Jim, that to me is uh, just, that's just acting. <laughs> it's impressive as hell. And then, you know, it's just, uh, and I just, I can't emphasize enough how much I love those people. I just, I adore Danica. I adore Stephanie. I adore Kari and Jason and Nolan and Denise and um, Chrisman. Uh, it is just a joy to get to work with these people. They're all into the show. You know, none of them sort of walk in the gate and going, okay, what do I have to do now? You know, they're all into it. They're all having fun with it. They love their characters and they care about what happens to their characters. And, you know, what Jason does with Forger to me, I mean, as much as we all love Jason as, as Wally and I do, but what he's done with Forger, I think is so brilliant because we had this notion and I think Brandon, you talked to Jason about it before uh, season three started. And we had this notion of what we wanted and he just brought Forger to life and created this manner of speaking. And I don't mean the no pronoun thing. That was my goofy idea, but the, just the, the way Forger talks and the clicking and all that stuff is just so and much the, fun. And, and he's and the separation Forger's, for Fred, you know, even the, yeah. the changeover for Fred Bug, you know, that was something. And we had a number of like side meetings with Jason where he just kind of kept coming at us with different ideas about how to approach Forager and, and make him unique and um, you know, little character things for him that we were able to work into the show. Yeah. It's just a great, great group. And so the great thing about that audio play was, as Brandon said, just the opportunity to showcase these actors, you know, what they used to call it on unplugged, you know, you know, just to showcase them, I think was, was just a lot of fun. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun to watch as a viewer. Just getting to see everybody do what they do best is just always, it was, it was so great just getting to see that and being like, this is so much fun. And everyone here is clearly having the most fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a quick final question about the audio play, because we are getting near the end of the time that I have with you. I am just curious. And if you can't answer this or anything, I totally understand. But what inspired you all to make Artemis the leader of the team in, going forward, as that was revealed in the audio play, so I don't think is spoilers. What kind of led to that idea? Uh, it, was, it felt organic, honestly. Yeah. You know, uh, I think, you know, obviously Calder began as the lead, Aqualad did, back in season one. By season two, it was Nightwing. Um, the implication, I think, after... Nightwing left and, and Calder came back, but then Calder left to join the Justice League is that Batgirl was a uh, leader for a time. And then Miss Martian, and then Miss Martian stepped down for, I think, really legitimate reasons at the end of season three. So who would take over? And, and it just at this point seemed natural that Tigress would. Yeah. And so that became, again, one of these situations of the characters telling us what would happen next uh and so yeah tigress is uh the current leader of the team yeah i know i know i'm very excited to see it i'm sure other people are it was one it was one of those things where i was like i hadn't thought of this possibility and now that it's been presented i cannot wait <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i think you know the thing at the end of season three was that nightwing miss martian aquaman oracle a lot <laughs> you know, we're all implicated in the whole anti-light thing. Yeah. And all of them felt, I think rightly, that they needed to step down away from a leadership role and, and be soldiers again, you know, and not be the ones calling the shots. And so you needed someone who wasn't implicated in that to step forward, who had the experience to, to lead that team. And I don't think uh, there are certain characters like Miss Martian, Nightwing, and Tigress who just have no particular interest in becoming public heroes with the yeah. Justice League. It's just, they're not into it. They don't want to be outsiders either. They're, they're just, it's not who they are. They like being sort of covert heroes. They want to be heroes, but they don't need to be out front. Yeah. And so from among those three, two of them were sort of disqualified from leading, um, at least temporarily. 
least for the time being. And so that left the third one. And, and of course, Tigris is eminently qualified to be the leader at this Absolutely. point. Um, and she's grown as a character so much. It's so fun to see Artemis's journey. And, and again, you know, uh, just Stephanie is so great in the role and, and her journey from this fairly immature 15 year old that we met in season one, who, you know, was so defensive and so closed off and, and so afraid, um, not of the action aspect of it, but of the interaction with people aspect and seeing how she's grown as a character is again, one of the unique joys of young justice is, you know, most shows for all intents and purposes take place at no matter how many seasons they last, it might as well all take place over one summer, you know, and that's not necessarily a negative, but one of the joys of young justice is time is passing. And we are, you know, Artemis was 15 in season one when, and as we go into season four, she's 25 and that's a big difference. And you almost never get to see that in a cartoon show. In fact, you rarely get to see it in a live action show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think it's one of the things that's really sort of unique about YJ is that it was built for growth in a real significant way that other shows can't do because they're sort of locked in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower. Greg, Brandon, where can people find you here on Earth Prime? <laughs> Out in the world. Share your social medias, any upcoming projects, if you would like to. You don't have to. We can skip over this bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just Brandon Vietti on Twitter, so just search my name and you'll find me. I don't have the, the fancy check mark, though. I think <laughs> Greg's got the check mark. <laughs> but I don't think there's too many, too many people on Twitter with my name. You'll find me. Uh, I'm at Greg underscore Weissman on Twitter. I am trying not to spend too much time on Twitter these days because it became sort of a strange, perverse addiction kind of thing that was not good for me, I don't think. Um, but I go on occasionally, usually when I'm bored, like if I'm, often when I'm like pumping gas, like I'm waiting for the gas to finish, so I'll go on Twitter at a gas station or like in an airport or something. Of course, I'm not driving much, so I'm not getting much gas, and I'm not flying anywhere. But uh, but yeah, every, every once in a while, if I get bored, I'll get on, get on Twitter. You can also go to my website, which is askgregweisman.com. The question asking function is currently closed because I've got something like a thousand plus questions backlogged <laughs> to answer. But I've started answering again, just like five questions a day. Nice. Um, so you can check that out. And there's also an archive of questions there, many about Young Justice that goes back years. So odds are most of the questions you want answers to have already been answered in the archive. Nice. Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at thyjfiles.tumblr.com, and our website crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that isn't enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. We are everywhere. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. The internet's just like that sometimes. And if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews once those become a thing again, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and so much more. And as always, stay well, stay well everyone. everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. 
Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.